Hello everybody, welcome to number 27. I'm Jack and this is a Gordon Keeble, a car with a beautiful body designed by Giugiaro at Bertone. It was faster and cheaper than an Aston Martin DB4. And yet, with just two years of production under its belt, the company went bankrupt. In this video, I'm going to explain the extraordinary circumstances that led to this. And just in case you think the problem is how it drives, let's start with that. was originally founded by John Gordon and Jim Keeble, not by a chap called Gordon Keeble as many assume. Now Gordon himself was one of the co-founders of the Peerless Motor Car Company and Keeble was a, a car designer. The Peerless Car Company went bankrupt after I think just three years but just before it went bankrupt there was a a voodoo American fighter pilot that was stationed in the UK and he asked Gordon, when he was still part of Peerless, to change the running gear of the Peerless car from Triumph to an American V8. And that was the inspiration for what then became this car. The Gordon Keeble has a very unusual mascot. It is a turtle and it's quite strange to think that for a car which at the time had ample performance they decided to go down that route but legend has it that when the first publicity photos were being taken the pet turtle of one of Gordon's friends got into the frame somehow and being that kind of chap he decided that's what he was going to use as the emblem for the make. This car was launched at the Earl's Court Show in 1960 and it caused a bit of furore because it was faster than an Aston Martin DB4, it had 300 horsepower instead of 240, so 0 to 60 was 7.7 .7 seconds instead of 9 seconds, it had 10 mile an hour almost higher top speed at 148 miles an hour, but it was way cheaper. At the time of launch, it was supposed to be £2,600 against £3,900 for the slower DB4. Unfortunately though, it wasn't produced until four years later, until 1964. By that stage, the engine that they were going to use had changed as well. It was still a Chevy unit from a Corvette, but it was a more modern 5.4 litre unit. I think the original was a 4.6 that they'd looked at putting into it, so no bad thing. Production for this was short, two years. They only managed to make 80 cars before it went bankrupt. So is it because of the way that the Gordon Keeble performed? Perhaps it has some faults. Let me tell you my experience driven it around earlier with Len, the owner. Thank you so much, Len, for trusting me and bringing this down, by the way. For a car of the 1960s, I think that what strikes me is that it takes very little to get used to it. It does have some of the characteristics of older cars. It is a little bit floaty, but in exchange, you get an absolutely brilliant ride and it feels very well damped. It's not a sporting car, it is supposed to be a GT after all. So the steering is quite slow. It's got some nice feel coming through. It's well weighed. This version does have power steering. A lot of them were changed to that. This also has another very big difference, which is it has an auto gearbox. And again, that is a great improvement for a car like this. The manual gearbox, which I think was also in the Iso Grifo, was quite a, a heavy lump to use. The auto makes things a bit easier. The pedal box is extremely cramped and it's also offset to the right. Having three pedals in there, I think would have made it really difficult to use. Certainly for someone like me with um, size 11 feet, it would have been a bit of an issue. 
Let's see how it goes down the road. Still rapid, let me tell you. Seven and a half seconds by modern standards to 60 isn't amazing, but it's really not bad. One thing that does strike me is that it's got an incredibly heavy throttle and that it becomes incrementally harder to push the further it goes down the rev range. That may be normal or perhaps it's peculiar to this particular car. I'm not really sure. But it's just such an effortless engine. There's so much torque. has a square section frame chassis on top of which sits a fiberglass body. It was originally styled by Giugiaro, Weiler, Bertone and it is absolutely beautiful. I think the original prototypes had metal bodywork but for production to reduce costs they went with fiberglass. The panel gaps on this one though look absolutely spot on. Generally speaking you wouldn't tell that it was a fiberglass car just from looking at it. It also feels pretty refined. At 60 miles an hour, there isn't that much wind noise. The ride is very, very good and it feels quite solid. It has soft suspension, so you're not really taxing the chassis too much, but it doesn't feel like it's a weak chassis, like there's a lot of movement in it. And the interior, this slab here of instruments, which is supposed to be inspired, I think, from um, aeroplanes, it just looks glorious. The reason why it's so prominent in the cabin is that Gordon wanted the engine as far back in the chassis as possible to help handling. That does have the undesirable side effect, though, that it really protrudes into the left-hand side of the footwell there. To me, that does get in the way and it is a bit annoying. There's some other incredible touches. When I first saw the fire extinguisher, I assumed that was aftermarket, but Len, the owner, tells me that they did come with fire extinguishers like that. People felt let down at the time because it came in vinyl. This car has been retrimmed, but faithfully, it has been retrimmed in the original vinyl and looks, looks absolutely beautiful, I think. It has wishbones at the front and a D-Dion arrangement at the back. From what I remember driving a DB6, which in itself I think is just a development of the DB5, the Gordon Keeble is actually a bit more of a, it's a more refined arrangement. It seems to move a little bit less on the road and just feels a bit more together. Quite unusually for the time, it had discs all around, and even in this car, they are still pretty good. And also electric windows. Things that may not amaze you now, but electric windows were very, very uncommon. The driving position is excellent. My torso's in the right position, the wheel is in exactly the right place, and you don't have to worry about the gear change. The left leg is okay, but it is pushed in to the center of that of the footwell which is probably the only criticism I would give to it you do have ever present the Werble from the GM small block but it's otherwise really comfortable so the looks weren't the problem the price wasn't the problem the way it handles isn't a problem all in all it's a brilliant car the reason why it went bankrupt has nothing to do with the well it does have something to do with it but it has nothing to do with the abilities or whether this was a good or bad car it is an excellent car. So what happened? When it was being designed and when they were trying to put it into production, one of the things they found is they wanted to put rack and pinion steering. But finding a supply at that point in time was a bit of a problem. So instead of rack and pinion, they went for um, a worm, worm and roller setup from, I can't remember now if it's Aldon, something like that, I'll put up the name now. And that was to have wide-ranging repercussions for the Gordon Keeble. Initially, production went quite well, but at that price of 2,800, and by the way, I've just realized I said the wrong price for the Aston, it wasn't 3.8, it was 4.2, so 
really quite a lot more expensive, but at 2,800, they were really only getting enough money together to be able to produce the next cars. They weren't building up enough of a, a chest of profits. And what happened was that at the company where they made the steering racks, there was a strike, which meant that Gordon Keeble had, I think, 16 cars almost ready on the production line, which they couldn't deliver because they couldn't put steering racks on them. After a few months, they went bankrupt, having produced just 80 cars. Interestingly, though, this is car number 81. How can that be? Well, from bankruptcy, a consortium took on Gordon Keeble, and I think another 10 cars were produced. And then over time, a few others were made, bringing the total up to 100 cars, of which, incredibly today, still 95 survive giving you an idea of just how loved these are. So it's yet another sad story for the British motor industry. Make a brilliant car and trust me, this really is very good. And still, you have a high likelihood of failing for circumstances largely outside of your control. If you want me to do a review of one of your own cars, please get in touch and we can arrange something. Thank you so much to Len for bringing this down. It was a real privilege to drive this today. And of course, thank you to all of you for watching. See you for the next one.